Okay, rethinking the lawn. So a uh, quick little um, plug for the Master Gardeners. It's a great organization. Um, we are trained, trained non-paid members of the, uh, UC Cooperative Extension. UC is the University of California. We answer questions and provide research-based information on home, home horticulture, pest management, and sustainable landscape practices. And by the way, I wanna mention, um, uh, we're gonna be at the county fair starting a week from tomorrow. And in our demonstration garden, we're gonna have something that shows um, sheet composting or sheet mulching, which we're gonna talk about um, in a little bit. So please come by and, and see us. And there's gonna be lots of examples of uh, good plants to put in, uh, in your garden instead of a lawn. So let's talk about what we're gonna cover this evening. We're gonna talk about why to replace your lawn three methods to remove a lawn and what to put where your lawn was instead. So let's, let's get started. So why replace your lawn? You know the big one and that is to save water. So here are some facts. Lawns use more land and water than any single ag crop in the United States. They're, they're, they're everywhere <laughs> anyway. A third of Marin's water use um, uh, for gardens, most of it goes, goes for lawns. So uh, drought is inevitable and because of climate change, it's um, going to become more frequent and more intense. And in the recent past, we had our driest record um, since record keeping began in 1895. And right now, most of the West is in a severe drought. In some areas, it's the worst in 1200 years. So um, these are all things we know intuitively, but um, it is serious business. In California, 60% of the state's water needs are met by groundwater. So taking water out of the ground, underneath the ground to water. But in drought years, uh, in, <laughs> that's in drought years. We typically use 40%, but it's 60% during drought, a 50% increase. So that, that's a lot of water. And because of that, in some parts of California, the land has actually sinking. It's actually gone down a little bit by one foot or more a year. So when you think about it, we're sort of, we're affecting the planet, we're, you know, the elevation. Um, so that, that's, that's a little um, concerning. So here's the question. Can your plant choices really make a difference with this water situation? And the answer is yes. So let's look at a couple of uh, numerical examples first. So in this lawn um, to the left here, um, that could be something that's um, pop-ups, little pop-up sprinklers um, water. And pop-up sprinklers are measured in gallons per minute. So in this little lawn, if there were seven heads, seven spray heads there that popped up and they ran for 10 minutes, that could use maybe around 70 gallons of water each time you, each time you water. In this next photo here in the middle, if you swapped out that lawn and you planted 50 plants, it's a lot of plants to put in that space, but if you had 50 little emitters on a drip system, drip is measured in gallons per hour. And so if you had 50 one per gallon, one gallon per hour drip emitters running for 10 minutes, so the same time that those spray heads were spraying, you would only use eight and a half gallons of water. So you can see it's, it's a significant difference. And of course, there are gardens that once established use no or low or very low um, amounts of water. So we'll get into that. So we also know that the Marin Municipal Water District um, is proposing a ban on decorative grass um, on, at commercial and municipal sites. Um, they estimate that there are 73 acres of non-functional turf. That's a lot, uh, um, you know, that basically just grass that isn't used, but you, that you've got to water and care for. Um, and certainly situations like this on the right where we're watering pavement, we definitely don't want situations like that. So, so saving water is really a given. We also save energy. That's a big benefit of, of, um, of swapping out grass for something else. Moving water uses 20% of California's electricity. Um, one out of every kilowatt goes to a, um, uh, is because of moving water. So you think about it, think about how much water is moved from Northern California to Southern California and everywhere in between. It takes a lot of energy to pump that water around. So, keep, so please bear that in mind. And so this is, how, this is how that works. 
Saving water saves energy. Saving energy cuts down on greenhouse gases, and that helps mitigate climate change. And that helps reduce the frequency and intensity of drought. So it's sort of a circular thing, isn't it? But you, you can just see that how incredibly beneficial it is to use less water. And of course, lawns also um, uh, take a lot of fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides, and those all take energy to produce. Now, I know in Marin County, we're a little bit more, I think we're all ahead of the game in terms of not using uh, nasty things that we don't need to, but I can assure you that they are used far and wide, both in California and beyond um, on lawns. So that's something to bear in mind. And of course, lawns take a lot of human energy. Uh, and look at this poor guy. Um, you know, honestly, I don't know any other plants in my garden, at least, that um, are as high maintenance as a lawn, um, where you have to mow, clip, edge, aerate, feed, seed, weed, and water. That's a lot of maintenance for one type of plant. Um, so um, I think that Often lawns are sort of rolled out because people know how to take care of them and it just feels like a safe choice, but it is, an, and it is a very high maintenance um, decision uh, or high maintenance choice, as well as all these other um, uh, problems. Of course, when you save water and energy, you also save money and who doesn't wanna save money? So that's a good thing. And it helps reduce pollution. Lawn care chemicals are huge, uh, are, are, are gargantuan. So they pollute air and water. There are 800 million gallons of gas per year and 90 million pounds of fertilizer. 78 million pounds of pesticides are used to care for lawns, in addition to a lots of noisy machinery that none of us really like. So here's how that works. Lawn chemicals run off into lakes and streams, creeks, and in our case, our beautiful bay. Unfortunately, they can kill or harm insects and fish. This can disrupt the food chain and it can also degrade our drinking water. So this is something, whether it's on a lawn or anywhere else, we do not want this to get into our groundwater or any water. And I have this short uh, video that explains this really well. So this is just a couple minutes, here we go. pollution is a widespread national problem and is well documented in places like the Chesapeake Bay, the Mississippi River Basin, and Puget Sound. Nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus are a natural part of the ecosystem. They support the growth of aquatic plants. But human activities cause an excess of nitrogen and phosphorus in the environment. Surface and groundwater becomes polluted creating a serious problem known as nutrient pollution. Nutrient pollution can affect you and your family's health as it threatens our drinking water supplies and places where we like to swim and fish. Excess nutrients can also cause an explosion of algae growth called algal blooms. These can be foamy, scummy, or a thick mat of slime on the surface of the water or along the beach. Some algal blooms are harmful because they produce toxins that can make people sick. These blooms also hurt tourism, reduce property values, and drive up water treatment costs. The nutrients move downstream, killing fish and creating large dead zones where no aquatic life can survive. It's one of the most serious water pollution issues facing our nation. Nutrient pollution comes from farms, lawn fertilizer, pet waste, city streets, faulty septic systems, and sewage treatment plants. Limiting nutrient pollution from excess nitrogen and phosphorus will protect people's health, support the economy, and keep America's waters safe for swimming and fishing. Awareness is the first step in preventing and reducing nutrient pollution. Learn what you can do to make a difference at epa.gov slash nutrient pollution. Okay, so that's um, just a quick reminder of um, how important incredibly important it is that we keep chemicals as, as much as we can out of, out of our waterways. Okay, so let's also talk about some EPA, 
EPA findings about common lawn fertilizers, herbicides, and insecticides. And these are direct quotes from um, the EPA. Some lawn chemicals threaten native plants by harming beneficial insects that safely control weeds and unwanted insects. Lawn chemicals account for the majority of wildlife poisonings reported to the EPA. Several types of cancer, immunoresponse deficiencies, neurological diseases, and birth defects have been associated with exposure to lawn chemicals. And rates of lymphoma in pets of pesticide users are significantly higher than occurrences in the pets of non-chemical users. So this is just a reminder that if you do have a lawn or any type of garden to, to really um, try and minimize the use of um, harmful chemicals. And of course, taking out your lawn allows you to make better use of the space. Lawns are also often referred to as green deserts. And I think these two side-by-side -side photos sort of uh, describe, uh, kind of show that quite well. Question is, where would you rather be a bee or a hummingbird or a robin or really a human for that matter? Look how much more life there is um, with all the plantings on the right, right? It, um, it's just a, so much more inviting and colorful and in keeping with the surrounding environment. You can also create a sense of place. You know, our, our state is called the Golden State for a reason, right? We are very golden right now this time of year and um, characterized by these gorgeous rolling hills and green oak uh, and oak trees um, and so forth. It's a beautiful iconic look and it has nothing to do with this type of look, which is something that we've borrowed from places where um, it rains much, much more. So um, please consider that difference and, and think about the look of our state when you think about landscaping your garden. So replacing your lawn is a key step in creating a sustainable earth-friendly garden. So how do you get started? Let's talk about three ways to remove a lawn. We're gonna talk about how to dig, solarize and smother a lawn with the goal of having plantable space for the most part when you're done. So let's have a look. So digging your lawn out. This is something where you would use a sod cutter. It can be pretty hard work and um, it can be expensive to you know, rent the machine and so forth. And then uh, of course the sod is dumped in the landfill which we're trying to avoid. Um, and that can take a long time to compost. And um, this also disturbs the topsoil, um, that ecosystem of the, of the incredible life that's underground. It really is like a tornado and an earthquake all at once um, for the underground uh, creatures. And that is not something we typically want to encourage. And it can leave leaves, um, it can leave weed seeds and roots. So um, unfortunately, if you plant right into this, uh, you know, after you've taken sliced off the top lawn, um, some of the things, uh, weeds and so forth can come right through. So here's just a reminder of all the unbelievable life that's in um, under our feet, you know, from earthworms and um, mic microscopic um, life. It's just, it's teeming with activity below our feet and that's the way we wanna keep it. It's so incredibly important. So next we can solarize a lawn and this is where you mow the grass down and you leave the clippings, you wet it and then you cover it with a uh, clear plastic. You can edge it with bricks, or in this case, looks like they backfilled in this photo, backfilled with um, soil, and you leave it there for a couple of months and it really uh, kills everything that's underneath there. <clears throat> so the pros are, is that it does kill um, weeds um, and sod because they just, they basically get fried, um, and, but it doesn't build soil and it's pretty unattractive. And then when you're done, you've got to go back and um, probably take out some of that soil and backfill anyway, because you've killed everything in it, right? It just becomes sort of, I guess, inert. So um, uh, that's, not, that's not often the best choice, but it can work in some situations. So we're gonna focus on smothering your lawn. This is called sheet mulching or um, sheet composting. Um, sometimes it's referred to as a lasagna method, which you can see there on the bottom left, um, why it kind of looks like slices of uh, environmental lasagna. Um, and this is an easy, free, or cheap um, method. 
It recycles materials and provides healthy soil. You can berm things up uh, for instant planting, which you'll see in a second. And um, it has a very simple recipe, some organic material, cardboard, and some mulch. So I have a video here that um, takes you exactly through the process. This is um, about six and a half or seven minutes, um, but it uh, really illustrates um, the process. So here we go. Hi, my name is Kat. I'm a landscape architect, and today I'm going to show you how to rethink your lawn the bay friendly way. Now, here's what a conventional lawn looks like ornamental and underused, but now lots of folks are transforming those lawns into bay friendly gardens. These diverse and beautiful gardens will help you use less water, are easier to maintain, require less chemical fertilizers and pesticides, save energy, and produce fewer greenhouse gases. In addition, they also build healthy soil and plants. Replacing your lawn is a great opportunity to create a bay-friendly garden. You can create a habitat for bees and butterflies, start your own vegetable garden or orchard, create an urban retreat, or a perfect space for you, your children, and your pets. The possibilities are endless. And once you develop a plan, the rest is pretty easy. Now I'm gonna show you how to sheet mulch. Sheet mulching is a cheap and easy way to replace your lawn. If you don't wanna do your entire lawn, you can start with just mulching a part of your yard a little bit at a time. It doesn't require the use of heavy equipment or pesticides. And once you have the materials, sheet mulching can be completed in a day, depending on the size of the area you are covering. So let me explain how sheet mulching works. Sheet mulching is a technique of laying cardboard or newspaper over an existing lawn and then topping it off with wood mulch. The layers break down naturally to feed the soil with microbes, creating a vibrant ecosystem, which is going to give you healthier soil and plants. But sheet mulching is also an ideal way to suppress weeds, build your soil health and replace lawns. The best time to sheet mulch is in the fall to take advantage of the rains, but it can be done any time of the year. There are many different ways to sheet mulch, but I'm gonna show you a simple way recommended by the Bay Friendly Program. First, you're going to prepare the site. If you have tall weeds, you're going to want to knock them down or mow existing vegetation so that it lies flat. Then remove only woody or bulky plant materials. If you plan to retrofit your sprinkler heads for drip irrigation, be sure to flag the sprinkler heads now so that you can find them again when you're done. I'll show you all about sprinkler head retrofitting in part two. Now, some plants are going to need to be removed before sheet mulching, such as invasive plants that spread by rhizomes, bulbs, or that re-sprout from extensive root systems. Some examples include blackberries, oxalis, horsetails, kikuyu, and Bermuda grass. When removing these invasive plants from around plants that you will be keeping, be careful that you don't damage the roots of the plants that you are keeping. Next, we're going to soak the area with water to start the natural process of decomposition. To avoid runoff and keep mulch from spilling over onto sidewalks or driveways, you can use a flat edge shovel to cut the lawn away eight to 12 inches from the edge of the concrete. The soil should be at least three inches below the grade. In other words, three inches below the top of the concrete. Your excess soil and sod can be mounted away from the edges and sheet mulched in place. If you're sheet mulching a lawn, just flip the edges over so the roots in the soil are face up. If you encounter the plastic netting that came with your sod, don't worry about it. Throw away the pieces that you see. Your leftover soil and any extra plant material or prunings can be used to create mounds for plants that like well-drained soils. Many native plants thrive on these mounds. Mounds also create more visual interest in the garden by adding height and depth. All right, once the area is prepped, then you're ready to install five gallon or larger plants. Next, you'll add a weed barrier. It is essential that this barrier be permeable to water and air. Recycled cardboard boxes work great. You can get big sheets of cardboard from appliance stores or bike shops. You can also buy recycled cardboard rolls or use multiple layers of newspaper or burlap. Be sure you don't use plastic or weed cloth, which won't biodegrade. Remember, this is all about building your soil naturally. When you're placing your cardboard pieces down, 
Be sure to overlap the pieces by six to eight inches so the sun won't get through them. You want to starve your weeds of light. As you're working, you can rip and fold the cardboard to accommodate the space around your plants. Now completely cover the ground except where there are established plants that you don't want to cover. Cover all green lawn to keep the sunlight from hitting it. Remember, any lawn showing at the end of the project will come right back. Next, we're going to wet down the cardboard to keep it in place to make it easier to shape around obstacles. When you're done covering the existing lawn with cardboard, it's time to add a layer of compost and mulch on top. Spread your compost directly over the cardboard and then cover it with bulky materials like wood chips to optimize weed control. Adding compost will help build soil. However, if your main goal is weed suppression, you can just add the mulch and skip the compost. In total, the compost mulch layer should be about two to five inches deep. The top layer of mulch mimics the newly fallen organic matter of a forest. Good materials for this layer include chip plant debris, tree prunings, leaves, or even straw. You are going to need a lot of mulch. Typically, a smallish front yard can take 18 cubic yards of mulch. To find local sources for mulch, please see the resources accompanying this presentation. Now that you've laid down the cardboard and covered it with mulch, you're going to punch holes in the cardboard and place your plants in the soil under the sheet mulch. In cooler climates, smaller plants like four inch pots can be planted right into the mulch compost layer on top of the cardboard without digging a hole. Don't worry, the roots will break through the cardboard. You will want to add compost just around the root ball if you didn't already add compost on top of the cardboard. If you did, you're good to go. Remember, your new plants will require water and attention when they're young, even if they're drought tolerant. Just a couple other things to keep in mind. Don't pile materials up against tree trunks or stems of plants. This will help them stay healthy and disease free. Especially during the dry season, small seedlings may need protection from snails and slugs that like to hide under the mulch. You can protect young trees from rodents with physical guards like metal bands that wrap around the base. So congratulations, your lawn has now been sheet mulched and you've laid the foundation for a beautiful bay friendly garden that you will enjoy for years to come. Great. So I think that she does a lovely job of laying out the, the steps for uh, sheet composting for sheet mulching a lawn. Um, and you can see that in her case, she didn't, um, she didn't take out the whole lawn, she just did part of it. And that's another advantage. You can kind of decide, um, maybe you just wanna reduce the size of your lawn for whatever reason. So, okay. So, and of course, um, right now you can take advantage of cash and material incentives through um, MMWD and North Marin Water District. And um, Greg already talked about that, um, that it can be up to $3 per square foot for lawns um, and for a maximum of 5,000 for residential and $20,000 for commercial sites. Um, and again, those are subject to change um, depending on what's going, what MMWD decides. And it, um, the North Marin Water District, um, they have $100 per 100 square foot, square feet of lawn for a dollar per square foot, maximum of $800 for single family um, uh, dwellings. And they also provide free compost rolls of cardboard and wood chips um, as part of their Lawn Be Gone um, program. And so you can do it yourself with those free materials, which is really, really nice. So there you go. So the question is, you've smothered your lawn, now what? The good news is it does not have to look like this, right? This is, I think, what we all, what some people used to think. I take out my lawn, I put in rocks. Um, which is not what we uh, recommend, um, but it could quickly go from this to this. Here's a, here's a um, before and after. This is actually my garden. Um, shortly after we moved into our um, house, um, we had this kind of, um, a, this is a big sweeping lawn that went around things and uh, it just was, you know, a big pain in the neck and um, took a lot of water and just got thrashed and I wanted to grow other things anyway. So we sheet composted a lot of it, not all of it, but, um, but some of it, and we created paths through it and so forth. And um, I, I think it's much more interesting space to be in. And here's another before, and here's the after, somebody who um, sheet mulched their lawn. 
You can see the one on the left of the lawn just almost looks like carpeting, you know, it's just so flat. And um, again, I just, me personally anyway, I don't find it that interesting. And, and certainly if I was a bee or a, some type of beneficial insect um, that you want in your garden, I probably wouldn't think it was so interesting either. And look how lovely it looks um, now. Um, he also, I guess this homeowner was very inspired because they also decided to paint their house. But, um, but the little, um, the plant combination there is, is very inviting. So a uh, good example. So the first thing you want to do is you want to, uh, when you decide what you want to put in where your lawn was, is you want to start by defining your objectives. I cannot stress this enough. It sounds incredibly boring, but you want to really think through how you want to use that space. Sometimes we're so used to looking at a certain area of our um, landscape in a certain way that we think it's the only way it can be. But, um, but you know, this is the time to really decide what you want and what you need. Right. So here are the questions. Um, how will that area be used? Right. Do you want to walk on it or sit there? Do your kids um, want to play there? Do you need a new entry or a pathway? Do you want color or do you just want a nice calm green color? Um, do you need storage? Maybe it's maybe it's a structure you need a shed or something in the back instead of a lawn. Um, do you need to block or enhance a view? What else? What are you starting with? I just I cannot stress that enough. It really pays to go through that um, thought process. And after that, um, a little side analysis. And that's just a, a fancy way of saying, what are you starting with? So do you have sun or shade? Do you, um, what's your microclimate? Does it get windy at your house in um, the afternoon? Is it foggy? Is it burning hot in the summer? What's your soil like, your water? How much time do you wanna spend in, that, um, in um, the garden maintain, maintaining it? What are the greater surroundings like? Are there things in your surrounding environment you want to um, uh, emulate or borrow from, you know, um, from around you? That's always a nice thing to do in the garden. Are there views you want to take advantage of? What else? All of the things that just make your space uh, what it is. So let's start with if you decide you want to walk on it. I want to stress this emphatically. Fake grass is not the answer. And there are two reasons why. The first is that it's unhealthy for the environment. And here's why. It removes space for living plants. Our planet right now needs living plants more than any time, right? It's so they, they help sequester carbon and um, they're, they're just so incredibly important. It provides zero wildlife habitat value for things like birds and hummingbirds and butterflies and bees and so forth, zero. It take fact, it takes it away. It kills the life in soil and leaves pieces of plastic in soil for many years. I've read articles um, that show that it leaves plastic in there for, from, it can leave up to decades or even longer. I mean, the, a lot of the, some of these plastics, they just don't break down. They're petroleum products, they just don't break down. They may be impervious, preventing leaves and other debris from infiltrating into the soil. This in turn reduces our groundwater uh, recharge efforts that we talked about a little bit um, earlier. So we don't want that. It does not sequester carbon. That goes back to um, uh, removes, removing space for living um, um, plants, the top. It, it can be very expensive and it can be energy intensive to produce depending on the type. Um, often it requires a leaf blower, which uh, not everyone's favorite tool to listen to, especially on a Friday afternoon um, or a Sunday morning. Um, it is not weed free. Um, sometimes, I, and this is such an unappealing look, but I'll see a fake lawn and it'll have weeds coming out of it. I mean, that's, that is what you call a bad look. Um, and um, often when, um, some, when somebody installs a fake lawn and they decide, eh, no, I don't want that anymore, they roll it up and they throw it into the landfill where it is not going um, to biodegrade anytime soon. In addition to being unhealthy for the environment, fake lawns are also unhealthy for humans. So because they can harm, um, harbor harmful bacteria for pet waste and other pollutants, they can get incredibly hot, causing injuries. I saw this when my um, children were younger and they were playing soccer on um, fake turf. Um, Off-gassing can add to air pollution, which can create respiratory problems for some people and pets. Um, sometimes um, 
the recycled rubber tires that uh, fake lawns are used are made from. While it sounds great to recycle, that can um, they can contain heavy metals and chemicals that are linked to cancer. And those little fake grass blades in the backing um, contain highly toxic chemicals known as forever chemicals. I'm not a chemist, and I don't I don't want to pretend to be. Um, uh, but these PFAS are not chemicals that we want. Um, we, don't, we don't want them in our environment. And um, here's the way that works. So children or even adults, of course, breathe chemicals from off-gassing. They also touch, we can also touch or swallow those little tiny rubber pellets that they put in fake grass to make it look like soil. I remember cleaning those out of my kids' uh, shoes and socks. Um, pellets get into shoes and clothing and they travel home in cars, um, come to our homes via cars. And those PFAS within those um, little pieces accumulate in the body. And unfortunately they don't break down. And that's why so many of us carry um, residue from those things in our body. And this is why the Children's Environmental Health Center of the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai has urged a moratorium on the installation of new fields with artificial turf. So please bear those facts in mind if uh, you or someone you know is thinking about getting a fake lawn. So how about something real instead? Let's look at some plants that um, are beautiful and um, in some cases walkable, which we'll look at. And um, uh, please don't worry about writing anything down or anything because I have all of this uh, in a leave behind, including all this and more information about the plant. So don't worry about any of that. So, of course, a lawn doesn't need to be manicured to be attractive. We see more and more of this type of look. Um, these are ornamental bunch grasses, and um, they use much less water than a conventional, really low, um, tight uh, turf grass. So here's one, Carex texensis, um, called a Caitlin sedge. This is a small clumping um, grass, uh, works in sun or shade, which is a selling point. Um, it's slow to fill in, and, but then it just grows four to six um, inches a year. Um, it takes moderate water, not as much as a lawn. Um, there's little small summer flowers. You could probably mow it about once a year and it's native to the Southwest. Um, so that's a clue that it probably prefers areas that are nice and toasty in uh, summer. So maybe for Northern or Western Marin, this um, could be an option. And by the way, you're gonna notice that I'm gonna be using the botanical names of the plants, Carex texensis for instance. And that's because if you do decide um, to order, you know, to, to use one of these materials, one of these plant materials in your own garden, I really strongly encourage you to only order it by the, by the botanical name. And the reason is because every plant only has one botanical name, but they have many, and often in cases, many common names. So if you just go in and say, I want to, I would like to get, you know, so much Caitlin Sedge, um, the person you're ordering from could look it up and find a completely different plant, but with that same name. And then you could, and, and then you wouldn't be satisfied when you got your order. So just a word to the wise. So Dimondia, Dimond, <laughs> can't talk, Dimondia margaretiae, um, silver carpet. This is an incredibly dense gray mat. It tolerates drought, cold, salt spray, poor soil. It's very deep rooted and has pretty little yellow flowers. It works great between stepping stones or like this photo, just to replace a lawn. Um, it's a South African native, a really, really incredibly durable um, uh, ground cover. And actually I will have uh, some of this at the fair that you can see um, and touch for yourself. It's really, um, it's really a great replacement. Zoysia dianza is a warm season grass, also very low water. Um, it does great with heat, even some shade. Um, it's used on sports fields and golf courses more and more. This one goes dormant in late fall until the temperatures start rising in spring. So it's kind of, it won't look quite as good in the so-called off season, but um, it, um, it, it, you know, if, if this is something where if you absolutely have to have the look of a lawn, this one would at least use less water. Carex flaca is a blue sedge. You're gonna hear me talk about a few sedges. It's just a type of um, plant, this, um, these, these clumping ornamental grasses. This one has an attractive blue green. I have walked on, it, on a lawn of this before and it was really pretty. I have to say it looked really nice. Works in fuller part sun with a little bit of water. 
Um, it's evergreen in frost-free areas and it spreads a little, out, little bit. It's gonna spread just a little, but not be invasive, won't become a problem. Um, it stays under a foot tall. You could mow it three to four times a year to keep it low like this, or you could just let it flop over if you like that look. Um, it's, it's a little bit slower growing than some of these others, um, but it will fill in. Um, and then it has moderate drought resistance once established, um, especially in uh, part sun areas. This is Festuca rubra or the red fescue. And I see this around Marin quite a bit. It's um, shade tolerant. It looks quite lush as you can see, um, kind of wavy like that. I think it's kind of a pretty look. It can grow one to two feet long. You can mow it and make it look like a conventional lawn. I do know um, a couple of houses who, that have that. It prefers, prefers cooler summer areas. So this is not, this is a plant more for Mill Valley, Sausalito, you know, uh, or shady areas. I know um, a house in Madrone Canyon where they have this um, uh, as a lawn replacement. Um, uses a little bit of water and a little bit more when it's hot, but again, not as much as one um, as a conventional lawn. This is one of my favorites. And um, this is what the stuff we always used to take out of our lawns or try and take out of our lawns, white clover or trifolium repens. This works in sun or shade. It's low growing, just stays four to six inches tall. It tolerates close mowing. It adds nitrogen to the soil, which we're often looking for. Um, it's drought tolerant, green year round, works in any kind of soil, attracts bees. In fact, some people feel that it attracts too many bees, the flowers, but if that's a problem, of course, you can just mow or mow some of them um, off. And one of its big selling points is that um, um, for pet owners, for dog owners, um, it doesn't leave any uh, pet urine stains. So um, that's kind of a nice bonus, but it, it, really, it really makes a nice, um, easy care ground cover. And there's a picture of it, a close up and a picture of what it looks like. It's just a really nice, soft, kind of a more natural look. And then a close relative um, is something that's, um, well, it, it's something that looks like it, but has been developed for drought and also flooding, ironically. Um, this is a fast growing, spreading, um, a sterile evergreen. So it's not gonna spread or, or become a problem. This is called um, Lipia nautiflora or um, it's um, the name it goes by is Corupia. Um, bees and butterflies love it. It's very deep rooted, so it can help with erosion, which means that it's great on slopes. Um, it's being used on highway shoulders, rooftops. Can't get more exposed than a rooftop, guys. There's no, you know, no shade there. Anyway, uh, for most anyway, in commercial settings, uh, public utility areas, commercial properties. It's a really tough, um, uh, tough plant. And these photos were taken at a friend of mine's who took out her lawn and replaced it with carapia. And she's been really happy. Um, you can see how it grows little, um, you know, like it's the stems kind of go out and you can just go along with the trimmer, right? And just trim it right off. So that's not a problem. And so this is what it looks like most of the year, especially when it warms up. And maybe in the cooler season, I think maybe it browns out just a little. I'm, I'm not really sure about that because this is when it was still pretty young. Um, she had something, she actually laid sod of carapia, but you can, you can get, plugs. you can order just the little plugs and put them in like every two or three feet and it's going to fill in like this. So a really great plant for um, a lawn alternative and much lower water. And then there's um, a University of California has a Verde Buffalo grass, um, Buccalo uh, decaloides, which is a, it's a cultivar. This was bred at UC Davis and UC Riverside. It loves heat. <laughs> it uses 75% less water than a conventional lawn. Um, it's lush in summer heat and it is brown in winter cold. So if you don't mind having something that browns out in um, the, then this could be an outstanding choice. Again, if you want something that um, really uh, mirrors the look of a lawn. And of course, there are all sorts of places where you can get California native seed and sod blends. This is a few of them. Again, I'll leave this in the resource list behind. Um, um, and so some really great um, places that we have that um, you can um, order from. So excellent resources. So let's say you want a grassy look, but you don't necessarily need to walk on it. There are a lot of options. Here are some more Carex um, options. <laughs> Dune Sedge, Carex Panza. Uh, needs a little water to get established. 
but then it requires very little. This is also a California native, which um, there's a lot of benefits to growing native plants. Um, it has sort of a meadow look, as you can see, and a little bit of light foot traffic is okay, but as you can see, it's gonna be kind of bumpy. It's not something you'd wanna be walking around on all the time. Uh, similarly, um, the field such um, Carex progracilis. This is another one that's good for erosion control or a meadow look. Even on green roofs, it grows or um, in you know strips and, so and driveways. It's very durable, tolerates drought, poor soil, salt spray, heat, cold, even some foot traffic. It can you can let it grow into a one foot tall, excuse me, kind of um, with a tousled appearance. It, it grows very densely, so it helps snuff out weeds. Um, this can be mowed or string trimmed. This too is a California native plant. Um, and this one is gonna turn a little brown inland in summer if you don't give it much water, but then it'll be back once, um, once uh, summer turns into hopefully our rains, right? In late fall or winter. And yet another Carex, Carex tumulacola, the foothill sedge. This is a California native, fast growing plant to two feet tall and wide. But this is a bigger field. This is not something you're gonna be walking around on as much. It works in wet or dry soil, sun in part shade, um, drought tolerant once it's established. Um, really looks really pretty in spring when it's blooming. You can see some of these little um, flowers um, sticking up. This is a really easy, easy and reliable plant. I wanna mention that when something goes in, grows in both sun or shade or sun or part shade, it's a real selling point because sometimes we have situations where we want something to look very consistent. Let's like say like you want just a green expanse, but and out of sun and shade, it's hard to get that. And this is a plant that um, um, that uh, is up for the job. So um, it's a great grass. Oh, and here's one. <laughs> I saw this on a walk. Um, this is, um, I'm pretty sure this is Carex tumulacola that this um, um, homeowner, chose to shrink the size of their lawn and, and, and put this edge on. I just love the way it looks. It's like a little poodle, and, um, but they're using less water. And I just, as soon as I saw that, I thought of that line, um, you know, honey, I shrunk the lawn. Um, I just think that it's so, um, I just think they did a really nice job with their lawn there, making it a little smaller. And another um, uh, native grass, Calamagrostis foliosa, uh, the Mendocino reed grass. Uh, it has beautiful um, coastal, um, creates this big mound. This photo on the right is from my garden. You can see how it looks nice next to stone. Uh, most of the grasses do. It's just a really nice um, contrast. It has this beautiful gray green tones. And then um, it gets a little purple, little streaks of purple in fall um, in winter. So pretty. Um, this plant likes um, sun and little or no summer water once it's um, established. And finally, the deer grass. This is a larger scale California native. Um, kind of goes through an awkward teenage phase where it just sticks up, you know, it just kind of has some, some guys, some, um, uh, you know, guys sticking straight up, but then it rounds out, creates these nice little mounds. Um, you could just water this one a little bit, one or two times a month. It's easy, dependable, long-lived. It's just a really, just a really easy care grass um, for a bigger scale. This gets like two to three foot feet um, tall and wide. And um, you've probably seen this grass around, Festuca glauca, um, glauca, the blue fescue, uh, such a cool color. And there's some cultivars that are even, that are super blue, you know, um, really nice, stays low. Um, it can take full sun on the coast, but it's gonna need a little shade inland, especially to keep that blue color. Um, it's drought tolerant when it's mature, um, uh, it, but it does not tolerate uh, wet soil. So that's usually not a problem in our um, area. Um, unless you, you know, you have a space in your garden where, where it's damp. But um, the one thing about this plant is it can be a little short lived. And I have seen this um, where it's faded, right? The blue starts fading after say four or five years. And um, so it's something where if you wanted to keep that look, you probably have to, you probably want to uh, replace some of it. But let's say you want to eat uh, <laughs> that space where your uh, garden was. You know, um, this is a great example of something where somebody has taken out a lawn, put raised beds right over it. You wouldn't even need to sheet 
mulch that, right? Because those beds are sort of acting as a giant, um, uh, very structured sheet mulching. And in this case, they're putting some um, hardscaping in the middle, which is a smart idea, much better than having some leftover grass be the edging because inevitably grass does not hold up for paths. Um, and it's not gonna like wheelbarrows rolling over it and all sorts of things. So that's a good use. So um, here's an example of a, a place where you could easily see this having been a, a lawn and just sheet mulched and planted um, edibles right into it. So you can see this artichokes coming up and so forth. So that's kind of a fun thing. And maybe it's just evergreen you're after, lots of good choices. Um, Tucrium, uh, the trailing germander, is a really lovely um, uh, heat loving um, ground cover, one to two feet tall and wide, uh, has beautiful summer flowers that the bees and the butterflies love. And this becomes a drought tolerant once it's mature. Baccarus pyularis, uh, the coyote bush, this is a particular, um, uh, you know, a pigeon point stays nice and low. It's native, it's a very important wildlife plant, but mercifully deer don't like it, gotta like that. Um, it's an outstanding choice for attracting a beneficial insects or they found, you know, scadzillions on this plant, which just really attracts them. Um, it gets about up to two feet tall, but 10 to 12 feet wide. So it really covers a big area and it gets little white, little sort of little, um, not super fancy, but uh, white flowers in fall. And um, um, this, is a, this is a great choice for ground cover. And all the manzanitas, <clears throat> the um, Arctostaphylos uh, as the genus, they are um, just such a gorgeous group of plants, whether it's trees or, or these ground covers. Um, emerald, emerald carpet is one that's um, often used inland where it's hot in summer, can grow a foot tall and about eight feet wide. And Pacific mist um, uh, is for cooler areas. Uh, so it gets about two feet tall and five feet wide. But the important thing about the manzanitas are that they bloom um, usually in winter and early spring. And they are the first plants that our native bees go for when they, um, when they come out to uh, grab a bite to eat. And um, so they need the manzanitas <clears throat> and the hummingbirds can't stay away either. And the native uh, uh, strawberry, the um, Fragaria uh, chiloensis is a lovely California native, grows low and wide. Um, it makes a nice dense uh, ground cover in a, like a, with a carpet-like appearance. It tolerates um, sandy soil. So on, if you're in a coastal area, that's good. And hot inland areas, if it has some shade and a, and a little extra water. Um, and it is um, very much cherished by birds. They'll probably beat you to those little strawberries. <laughs> ah, and if you love color, the sky is the limit, right? You can go nuts with uh, low water use uh, plants that still bloom and bloom hot colors and cool colors, right? Just so beautiful. Um, and of course, succulents are all the rage and for good reason. Look at how awesome they are. So many great colors and textures, shapes, sizes. I mean, they're just fantastic plants, chock full of water themselves, um, but they don't themselves require much water. Um, some, but, but not, um, you know, not gobs. And um, this is a, a neighbor of mine I was on a walk and I noticed this neighbor had slowly been turning their garden over into all um, succulents, which, you know, it's really great. You this having been a lawn um, prior to that. So um, I thought that was really kind of a creative use of the space. And um, of course, there's all these herbaceous ground covers, the creeping thyme, and you'll see verbena, lantana, and coreopsis um, in every nursery. And those are all um, long blooming, heat loving, uh, very colorful, easy care, uh, low water plants. And of course, I've been talking at natives um, and for a reason, they're just, they're just um, beautiful and um, they maintain our biodiversity. They're just, they're just a really important uh, plant choice. This is a smattering of some of our key California native plants. Um, the habitat heroine, the one that has more uh, life in it than anything is our, our beautiful oak trees. But of course, all these other um, beautiful native plants um, are, are part and parcel. They're just lovely. Create some habitat, um, you know, of the variety of pollinator and uh, plants and other plants that invite all the creatures that we love. Or permeable path, you know, if you're going to lay a path down, 
um, it's nice to do it so that water can slow, sink and spread underneath to help recharge our groundwater. New entry, you can see how this could have been something that was all uh, conventional lawn. And now this, and they, you know, they brought in these boulders and they um, put in these low water plants and it's, 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 it's a nice, interesting look, looks really nice. And here's something that could have all been grass before. This is probably three or four species of plants just repeated all over and it has a nice, you know, it has a nice soft look. Maybe you need a place to sit down, a little something to carve out a space. You know, you can always maybe turn your lawn area into a patio need one, you know, you can just put down gravel or, you know, um, of course, things like this, where it's going to be, um, you know, that's going to be a more expensive thing, but decomposed granite or gravel are um, less expensive options. And they just look so nice. And of course, you don't need to get rid of all your water. A little bit of the sound of water is great. And it, and it gives a drink to uh, some wildlife, the wildlife we want to, uh, in, to invite. And um, here's something, you know, less lawn, more pond. This is a, what I would consider a massive project, but you know, if you have the time and inclination and are up for it, pretty cool. Or maybe you need a fun play area for the kids. This is, uh, you know, in, when my kids were little, they played much more on the patio than they did on the lawn. And um, it was what our, my house looked like back then, my, my um, yard anyway. But um, you know you can do all sorts of things, and it doesn't have to be with grass, right? Something you don't have to maintain, or you want your own secret little garden getaway, and that would be a good thing too. And chances are you have deserved it. You have when you've deserved it, or you've earned it. That's what I meant to say. You've earned it. So that's it. And this is the um, as Greg mentioned early on. If you hold up your phone to this, like you're going to take a photo, it will sign you up for our quarterly free uh, newsletter called the leaflet. And I promise we're not going to pound you over the head with that. It just comes out quarterly with lots of um, good tips and seasonal advice, um, lots of education. So that's it. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Marie. Uh, some really great suggestions there for uh, the lawn conversion. Um, we did have a question from Chris, um, which I think has probably been answered, but I'll, I'll kind of run through it anyway, and maybe you can talk to it. Um, has a 1400 square foot lawn and looking to replace it with a ground cover can be kind of played on, can handle foot traffic uh, and children. Uh, say it one more time, a ground cover that can- Can, also... can handle a good amount of foot traffic, like foot traffic. children, children playing you. on it. I would, um, the Daimondia is a really great choice. Daimondia margaret margaretier. Um, the trifoliopins are, uh, that is the um, white clover. That's something that is a very durable. Um, and you can or literally order seeds for that and just, you know, spread them. And Rapia would be a good choice for that. K-U-R-A-P-I-A. -A. Um, some of the native grass blends you could use for that. At the Marin Art and Garden Center, um, when you walk into the Marin Art and Garden Center, the main, the little entrance, at the entrance, and you turn right to the right, there's, um, uh, the Master Gardeners do some, um, they have a program there for children and there's a lawn there that um, is a, a native grass blend and it's been there for a number of years and last time I was there it was still looking pretty good and I know that takes quite a bit less water than a convention it's a little bumpier but not bad nice thank you mm -hmm. um, these will all be in the leave behind I they, these options will be in there so you can check them out great um, Susan has her hand up, so I'm going to attempt to unmute Susan. I think she must have a question. Uh, can you, you should be able to ask you a question now, Susan. Hi, can you hear me? We yes. can, yes. Hi. Oh, great. Um, our backyard in Woodacre is our septic field, and it is covered by lawn and it was our understanding that we needed to leave it that way that we you know 
would be endangering the septic field if we messed with the lawn. Um, in other parts of our yard, we've been very involved with um, replacing with native plants and loving it, but we've maintained this grass and we don't know if in fact there is an option for over the septic field um, or not. And I realize that's kind of a specialized situation, but it occurred to us uh, to ask. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, and, and I am no expert on septic systems or, or, or septic fields. Right. Um, I wonder, you know, you might want to contact uh, MMWD and, and, and ask them about that. One thing that just came to mind, and, but again, I, I don't know if this would work, but, you know, if you just start seeding, say, the white clover into your lawn, then maybe you could at least use less water as it sort of transitioned because it seems like it would still have the same effect as a lawn over time but yeah, that's a good idea yeah but i don't i would check i you know check my work there right because um again this is something i don't have any expertise in <laughs> but it could be as you're saying that kind of a, a gentle a uh, replacement with seeding instead of reseeding grass. You could reseed with something else and then you're not disturbing what's underneath. Exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah. yeah, yeah. I agree with that. You can get, you know, native grass seed really inexpensively. Right. And, um, my, my suspicion is that the it's for the, you know, the roots of the grass uh, helping to filter the water maybe that's coming out of the septic system yeah um, right um but again i i'm i'm more of a work at a water utility so we're potable water and i don't know too much about septic systems but i'll i'll ask around and if i find anything out susan i will um i've got your name and i'll get in touch with you thank you yeah, very you, much. Uh, you know what I, I would encourage um you also to look at grasses that work for bioswales I know if you've noticed more and more a, a little drainage areas where we're putting in grasses that help filter um, things out before it goes off into the bay. Sometimes they use, there's a grass called Juncus, J-U-N. Um, anyway, that, that one um, I see is used a lot and some others. And so I would think that if it worked in that application, maybe it would work for, for you as well um, for a septic s situation. But again, I don't know. It, you, you might want to just check that out. Biofilters, biofilter grasses. Thanks. Thank you. Great idea. Yeah. Thanks, Marie. Uh -huh. um, so we've got a couple couple more questions here. Um, following on from the previous question, um, Brent asks about microclover. Is that a good? And I'm not uh -huh. familiar with microclover, so. Yeah, that is a really great question because, you know, another friend, a master gardener friend said, hey, I just planted micro clover. And I said, oh, what's the what's give me the botanical name. Right. And it said trifolium repens, which is the white um, the white clover that we were just talking about. So I would have to see what the exact <laughs> name was. But if it's that, then that's the plant we're talking about. And I don't know if there's a dwarf variety of that maybe that that's why it's called micro clover um so that's i don't know i'd have to know the exact name yeah it's a great example of why we use scientific names right, right. common names right. sometimes because there's so much confusion but yeah it does seem like that's probably the same plant um, I, so yes it works great <laughs> yeah we're, um, we're nerdy with those with those uh scientific names but it, it does pay <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I can get the next question. Uh, the two orgs giving away um, rebates for homeowners. So it really, and, and it depends where you live. So if you live, if your water provider is Marin Water, then contact Marin Water. If you live in Nevada or North Marin and, and you get a water bill from them, then they would be the folks to contact. It'll be an either or situation. Hopefully that answers, and they're called North Marin Water District. Right. Okay, and then the uh, next question is, 
not sure if we'll be able to answer this off the tops of our heads, but trying to somebody's trying to get an idea of how much it would cost to plant a 1,000 square foot garden with flowering native plants and grasses. Well, it would really depend on how you purchase those plants. So um, uh, all things being equal, assuming the site is ready to be planted. In other words, like let's say you've just sheet composted it or the soil is ready to go, you know, um, then it's just a matter of what you buy, right? So if you're going to plant seeds, it'll be extremely inexpensive, more work, a little riskier, depending on what you're what you're planting and when you're planting it. If you're buying four inch containers, you know how much those can be. But if you decide, oh, I got to have an instant garden and you buy a lot of five or even 15 gallon things, it's going to get, it's going to get pricey. I will say that with native plants, often smaller is better. Um, it just, they, well, for a number of reasons, but um, so four inch um, containers can be a really great way to start off with uh, native plants. And a, a good time to get that going is often in the late fall before the rains come in. Um, we hope the rains, <laughs> the rain comes. And um, so good luck with that. It sounds like it's an exciting uh, project. That's, that's really great. I, I agree with the, the four inch container, um, especially for natives. I planted my front yard using almost exclusively four inch containers and a couple of one gallons and the total cost, my, my front yard is about 500 square feet and the total cost was, you know, in the hundreds of dollars rather than mm -hmm. in the thousands of dollars. Yeah. Um, and it's amazing how quickly they get established. Yep. What I would add is um, when you're purchasing those is get a really good understanding of the mature size of those plants because some of them can get to be quite big in a relatively short space of time. And the worst thing is to have it, your landscape be too crowded. Yeah. The other thing I would recommend is right out of the shoot when you plant, be sure you keep down a good layer of mulch. Mulch is so critical for, for you know, just a lot of benefits, but native plants really, really benefit from having a layer of mulch around. Okay, we've got, we've got more questions. So next up is a question about gophers. Um, <laughs> to discourage gophers, should we pull a put a mesh down or are there other ways to discourage them going forward? If you know that you have a gopher um, problem or if you just wanna be super conscientious, absolutely put uh, the, the, the gopher wire down. Um, if you do have gophers already, then I'm, everything I've read and learned is that um, traps are the way to go, that that's, that's what does it. That's, that's how you get them. Um, so for what it's worth, a um, lot of the little myths about gophers, um, some of them are sort of unappealing to talk about what people have tried to keep <laughs> gophers away. <laughs> um, don't, they, they are unproven. They, they, don't, they don't seem to work, unfortunately. All right, uh, question from Michael. Um, he loves his roses um, and mm -hmm. actually his mother's roses, which he inherited with the house. Um, any tips uh, to maintaining those with less water? Oh boy, I am not a rosarian. Um, one of my uh, uh, colleagues that I work with very closely is an incredible rosarian and she could answer that so well. Um, I, I would, you know, one of the things we often say is we often overwater. And so I would just try and, you know, uh, bringing it back, right? Just watering a little less and seeing if you're getting the same result um, and keep and be sure and, you know, adding uh, compost and mulch to your soil so that your soil is so in such great shape, keeping that layer of mulch on to retain every drop of water underneath. And of course, using a really great drip system, which I'm sure you already are, um, that's going to be your ticket to using uh, less water. Yeah, uh, maybe. And the, and the on the screen is the if if you wanted to try and get more info is the help desk, um, yep. which is a great resource for the, for everybody for the, mm -hmm. from the master gardeners. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I would agree with what Marie said of kind of especially the addition of. Um, compost each year which can just be top top dressed around the plants yep. um, and it'll work its way in over time okay um, 
Oh, so going back to the micro clover with Brent, uh, mm -hmm. what you're saying is that it's a dwarf variety of Trifolium repens. Yeah, so I think that that sounds like right. um, that there's often you know the the genus and then the species of mm -hmm. repens, and then there can be lots of varieties, and and we've kind of kept it at a higher level here. So I think you're good to go with the um, micro clover. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, and then Brent says he's reading that the most popular in US is Pirouette and Pipolina variety. Hmm. Okay. I'm not, you know, with that one, uh, you know, we, I'd have to see what the advantages are, that, but the straight species is, is a pretty tried and true uh, choice. So it's interesting. Um, I just Googled, you know, uh, Trifolian repens dwarf. And what's interesting is it came up, Trifolium repens is a white dwarf clover. So I don't see a cultivar name. Right. This is, a, you know what, this is a botanist or, you know, the people who do, do this, um, move all these names around, I suppose they need more to do or something. I, I uh, yeah, I can't, I can't, I don't, I don't see anything with a variety or a cultivar. Interesting, but I would, I would love to learn about it if, if it exists. Okay. I think we've got one final question and, um, it's uh, uh, asking about fire resistant mulches. Ah, yes. Um, I would refer you to the um, Marin Master Gardener website. We have a lovely section on fire smart um, landscaping. And here's the deal with mulch. So there was a study done a few years back. I, oh, I'm trying to remember now, University of Nevada or someplace in Nevada, I forget now. But what they found was that a certain type of mulch was the most that was the most um, fire resistant had been composted for a number of weeks. And I'd like to tell you that we can replicate that here, but I've actually called around and I didn't find a compost that had been composted for that length of time. Um, the main thing you wanna do is to not put compost, excuse me, not put mulch um, in the zero to five feet around the perimeter of your house. That's so-called zone zero. That you wanna keep um, combustibles out of that area. That's, that's um, the, most, the most vulnerable, the most important area. From there, using some of the, uh, you know, uh, fur bark and so forth is, um, they, they say that's okay, especially if it's broken up in certain areas, like with some stone or, you know, non-combustibles so that if there is um, a fire, it helps break up the path of that fire before it gets to your house. So you can learn all sorts of um, things about this, about how you design and maintain a fire smart landscape um, on the Marin Master Gardener um, site. And I'll be sure and include that uh, link when I leave um, for the leave behind information. Great, thanks Marie. The, the, the one mulch we, we'd come across was uh, from West Marine compost that's composted, but I don't know how long it's composted for. Yes. Uh, Are you talking about the vineyard mulch? Uh, they have one called topper mulch. Topper, yeah, and there's topper. Yeah, I don't know how long it's composted either. I do know it's com. I do know that it's composted. I don't know if, if it was um, composted for as long as in the study itself, but at least it's something, right, where it was composted. Yeah. 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 Um, good, excellent, great questions. Yeah, um, great questions. Yeah. Well, once again, thank you, Marie, for your, uh, your time this evening. And thank thanks you. to everybody for joining us. Uh, it's great to see so many people interested in this topic. Yeah. Um, we will follow up with the resource that Marie mentioned. We'll email that out to you and um, stay in touch. Um, so with that, we'll close it out. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night.